We're going to go into our overview of HVAC. Uh, to do that, we have with us a guest. His name is Greg White. He's with Energy One Energy Corporation. And he has been in the HVAC industry for well, well, well over 20 years. What is HVAC? Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. The goal of this session to provide a basic knowledge to the HVAC concept, how to inspect the HVA systems, introduction to tools and materials for ductwork installation. Now, a lot of people don't understand about ventilation, but it's like in a room here that is the doors are closed and everything is closed. You still have to have air circulating throughout the room. Now, this is the HVAC task. Heats when, it, when it's cold, cool when it's hot. Humidify when it's dry, dehumidify when it's wet. Bring in outside air, circulate inside air. Exhaust strong pollutant point sources. Filter the air. Do all this when needed without noise, vibrations, and drafts. This is a map of the heating versus the cooling climate. Now, as you can tell, on the west coast, northwest, we got the marine. The hot, dry mix down here. Hot, humid, mixed humid and cold and very cold. Now, different ways of heating and cooling your home. We have hydronics, we have boilers, we have wet heat, which is steam heat. So we have radiators, in floor, baseboards, fan coils. We got forced air, heating and cooling, evaporative cooling, direct and indirect, mini split system, room, AC, heat pumps, and split package. Now, heat flows, we have, this is the convection. In your CAS, you've been learning about the heat flow, right? Convection, conduction, and radiation. Okay, now this is the hydronic heat. This is a fan coil. You'll find this fan coil down in downtown in office buildings. You could either heat or cool, run hot water through it or run cold water through it. And that's where you get your heating and cooling downtown. A lot of people don't understand. It's not just the big unit on the rooftop that's coming down and cooling, but it's these little coils in between and they are thermostatically controlled. And then you have right here the radiant floors. This is one of the best ways of, of heating, but it's in the, your coils in the floor, <laughs> and if you got ceramic tiles and in the floor, you get a leak, and them coils, you're gonna have to tear your floor up in order to repair it. But it's really good, because you're heating from the floor up. Use your feet is the first thing to get cold. You come in, and it warms you up, and that's why I say, I like the radiant floors, but very expensive. It has some of them 20, 30 year warranty on them. But I've known that they went out before the warranty was up. Uh, they use a liquid, glycol. And then right here, we got the boiler. This is a big uh, industry boiler. This is an oil burner boiler. So you'll probably see that more on the East Coast than you will out here. Uh, and then we have the baseboard, which the baseboards go up and it's water that you can have the baseboards around the room that connect it up to the boiler. It'll come up temperatures sometimes on the baseboard, 180, 190, and your heat will come off of there. Then you got the radiators here, and the radiators, that's the steam. We still have steam heat here. The East Coast, they really have them out there a lot, but we got steel in the radiator. So you just have to know the difference. Sometimes, these little connections on the radiator, the ends right here may leak and everything and you get a problem, but they're good also. And then also they put moisture in the air. Like a lot of times you'll see places where they got the windows steamed up and they got their windows up. You can, they probably got a radiator in there. The hydronic heating, this is the way that it's heated. You got the city water here and the city water comes in, it comes into a field valve. It goes and it comes down into the boiler it get heated up, come back through, you got a circulating pump, you got an expansion tank here. So you got, the, you got the air vent right here that lets air come out, purge it once it start. You got the circulator right here, the pump that supplies it to your baseboard heat. And then as it come back in, it returns, it comes back, and then it goes down into the bottom right in here. It goes right into there, and it boils and recirculates again. This right here, out of all of them, the forced air, I like the boiler types. 
The boilers, they last a long time. They'll last you for 30 plus years if you maintain them. The problem is, is that people do not maintain the boilers. They say, okay, well, I'll go turn it on when it gets cold and then gets to the run. And they see leaks and leaks and rust and they let it go. Leaks do not fix themselves. But if you maintain these boilers and service them, they'll last you and they're really good too. They can run to install. You can look at them from eight to $10,000 up, okay? And, uh, but they're good. This is the advantage of the hydronic heat is comfort, especially radiant floors, efficiency, it do not remove moisture, the zoning, the boiler efficiency. You got 80% non-condensing, you got a 90% non-condensing, which the 80% is a metal flue pipe and the 90% is PVC flue pipes. The disadvantage is cost. It's more expensive to add AC and leaks can be a problem. Now, the one thing is, is that when we talk about, zone, when we talk about zoning up here, Zoning means that we can take this room and split it up into four different sections. And we don't have to heat this whole area like we do with forced air. We can have a thermostat in this section, we can have a thermostat in that room, and that room, okay? And that's what it means about zoning. That's why it works a lot, it's a lot efficient. Okay, the different types of forced air furnace that we have are the upflow. The upflow normally would be in your basement and it supplies air up until your duct work. Then the next one we have the down floor. You usually find the down floor in a closet space and it, the air would be forced down and the, come out of the vents on the floors. The horizontal, you would find that in the attics or crawl space. The single stage, which is just one stage that comes on at 80%, it'll just heat up. When it gets to a certain temperature, it'll shut down. We have the two stage which you have a low fire and you have a high fire. And the low fire, when you come in and you turn your thermostat on and it want to get up to a certain temperature, say about 77 degrees, 75, 77, the low fire will kick in for about 10 minutes. And then the circuit board would tell the second stage, which is a high fire, to kick in and it would kick in. And once it gets up to temperature, then the high fire would shut down and the low fire would run. Now, you also have the variable speed two stage. Variable speed is that you have the motor that can ramp up, which is RPMs, to 850 RPMs. Then also it can go to 1050 RPMs. So it adjusts as the heating comes on, and it adjusts as the blow. As it gets high, then it'll, drop, it'll go up higher. As the temperature drops down, then it'll drop down to 850 RPMs, and you can barely hear it flow, but it's still circulating. You also now have the variable speed modulating, which the variable speed, just as I explained, it goes to 850 RPMs, and it will go to 1050 RPMs. Also, the modulating is where the temperature outside, let's say the temperature is about 35 degrees. The gas valve will adjust it, will modulate to 35% of the efficiency of the furnace, of the fuel that's coming in. That's what the modulating is. The one that I replace the most is the upflow. The types of fuel that we have is natural gas. We have propane and we have electric. Now this is a forced air furnace. This is, uh, this is a flue right here. This is a supply, can't really see that, but that's the supply your warm air to the house. You got to induce a draft motor right here, induce a draft fan. Now, if this does not work, that doesn't come on, the furnace is not gonna work at all because what the draft induce a draft fan does is if there's any kind of gases that's left up in the heat exchanger, it flues it out, takes it out. In other words, it's kind of a safety. It is a safety issue there. Then you got the gas valve here. You got your filter down on the bottom. You got your cold air return. You got your circulating fan right here, the blower that comes in there. The furnace maintenance, monthly change of filters, type one. Well, monthly, I suggest to people in the summertime when you turn your air conditioner on to change the filter monthly because you're messing with humidity 
and the dirt will get on the evaporator coils. And therefore, if you don't change your filter get dirty, it's gonna plug your coils up and the efficiency of your air conditioning and your furnace is gonna go down, okay? And so I tell people in the summertime when they're changing the filters once a month. Wintertime, I tell them every two months and people are lazy, they'll change it every three months, okay? It's just like oil in your car, you know? It's a change of 3,000 miles, you wait 4,000 and change it, okay? You have to thoroughly clean the furnace, check all sensors. We got safety sensors on the furnaces that tell you certain things. We got flame sensors on there. So you have to have people to come out and look at it and check and make sure all your safety sensors are working. Check the gas valve pressure. Uh, the pressure on the gas valve should be like three and a half inches of water column. Now, I was working on a furnace and I went to the furnace and the registers were so hot to the touch and the customer says, and the furnace was just like blowing, rearing like a torch. And so once I put my gas pressure meter on there and I found out it was high, it was like four and a half, five inches of water column. And when I adjusted back down to three and a half inches of water column, then everything was okay. And I do this, I say to check the gas pressures every time you get on a furnace, and it doesn't take a long time because people go on there and they start adjusting, taking the screwdriver and turning things up and you never know what they do, okay? So I do that as far as a safety issue. You check the heat rise across the furnace. Now heat rise is your heat that's going out of the furnace and the heat that's coming back in from the house and temperature difference. If you get somewhere around uh, 22, more than 24 inch temperature difference, within your reading, then you got a problem somewhere in your house, okay? There's a, and so we check that. Visually check for cracked heat exchangers with the furnace off, I may say, okay? Uh, flashlight, a mirror that will pull out and you can look in there and look and check for cracks. Test for CO and the exhaust output. The one thing that I do is I have my CO meter and when I go into a house, I always put it on the side of my belt, turn it on, put it on the side of my belt, and I will check the furnace for CO, always. Because the one thing about it is, it's about safety when you go into customers' house, houses. You can't assume anything. You know, well, I don't smell CO. You can't smell CO, okay? And so you have your meter on you, and you check that. Now, furnace and boilers efficiency. The 66 to 75% non-condensing has metal flue and a draft diverter. 80% non-condensing requires metal flu pipes intake, has fan assisted. That was the one like I showed you, they had the fan on it. 90% condensing has PVC exhaust flues and PVC air intake. This right here is the annual fuel utilization efficiency. It's the percentage of the annual average efficiency of a furnace. You may talk about uh, 80%. 70%, 80%, 90%, 92% is, that's the efficiency. Now your energy star requires an FU of 90% or better. So when you get into a 90% or a 92%, then it's a lot energy efficient. That's what the energy star requires. And they say that you, uh, you're saving a lot of energy at that point when you get on 90 or 92%. Now identify the appliances, the fuel type, exhaust, the draft of types, uh, and efficiency. Now this furnace right here, if I saw this furnace in your house and you wanted me to come and repair it, I'd probably tell you you need to replace it. And, and sometimes there's a point that you have to look at a furnace and say, that furnace is about 30 years old. You're like, I, I can't bring that back to life. Okay, no matter what you do, and you know it's problems and you talk to the customer about replacing it. Now this is the 66% to 73% efficiency. This does not have an inducer draft motor on it. It's just got a diverter, and that go to flu right there. That go to supply, you got the heat exchanger, you got the draft hood, you got the burners right here, you got the circulating fan, you got your motor right here. You got your combustion air that comes right into, there's a door and it's got vents on there, you come there. You got your air filter and you got your cold air return. Now this right here is an 80% efficient furnace. 
This here right there, that's your inducer draft motor. That's your gas valve. These are your burners right in here. That's the circuit board down here. And your circuit board controls a whole lot more of the furnace, what people think. It controls everything on the furnace. And uh, you got your blower motor. Now here, you got your heat exchanger right here. There was a problem that we had, our, me and a partner ran into on a furnace like this. And we kept looking, the flame was, instead of going straight into the heat exchanger, it was coming up like this. And we were wondering why. And so we looked and we searched all over. We couldn't find the problem. We changed the gas valve, thought maybe it's too much gas. We changed that and changed the circuit board. And then finally, we decided to take the evaporator apart, take the plenum apart, and pull the blower out. And we pulled them out. Now, right here, you got some little eyelids that you can see right there that is here. Now, what has happened, they get stamped together at the factory. Somebody had adjusted the gas pressure up so high that it heated up the heat exchanger and it popped the eyelids, OK? So it was a matter of time before carbon monoxide was going to get into the lady's house. But once we done that and took it all apart, see, it was like, OK? And we had to replace that furnace. But uh, a lot of times problems, you always think that it might be one thing and it's another. Never tell a person they got a cracked heat exchanger until you can really identify that they have a cracked heat exchanger when you can say, this is the problem. So we couldn't tell a customer until we found out that was the problem. Now this right here is a 90% efficiency York furnace. They are making them now a lot better than they used to. They're really energy efficiency because it's a lot simpler now. They don't have a lot of parts on them, okay? They're real efficiency. And it's the same thing as the, as the rest of them. And this is the 90%. You got your flue going out, and you got your PVC pipe right here. This is the flue right here, and this is the air intake. It brings air in. And so you got your inducer motor here. You got your primary heat exchanger. You got two heat exchangers on here. You got your gas burners. And you got another heat exchanger down here at the bottom, the stainless steel condensing heat exchanger. That's the second one. So, and you got your circulating fans, you got your air filter, your cold air return, and your motor. And also over here, you have your, it says condensate to the floor drain because you got water that comes out of there and it goes into the floor drain or either into a centrifugal pump. Uh, that water, if you got pets around, I suggest do not let them drink that water because it's very poison. The combustion requires three things. It requires air, it requires fuel, and it requires an ignition source. Now, this is a gas leak inefficient operation, cracked heat exchanger. Can anybody see where there's a crack in here? Now, if you see that, I'm sure you're not gonna go any further, a crack like that. You're gonna say, hey, pfft, this is it. That's when you tell the customer, hey, get another furnace, can't do nothing with it, and do not let them use that furnace, okay? When you see this right here, you have a responsibility, okay? So what you have to do is disconnect the gas, plug it up, set it off, plug it up, disconnect the electrical, you know, plug it up. Now, a lot of times what I would do is that if you would call, you can call public service, a utility company, and tell them what you found. Uh, you can send the customer a letter, certified letter, to let them know. Because you have to really cover yourself that you cannot use this furnace because that is a safety issue. And the number one thing is, is that we want in this industry is about safety. Okay, safety one, money two. Okay. <laughs> Fuel burning appliances. Combustion appliance zones or CAS testing is used to ensure combustion appliances are not spilling combustion products into the building. The CAS is, is sensitive to negative pressure. Stack effect can cause a negative pressure. Stack effect is where all the air, the hot air is coming up from the bottom and going out the top of the house and cold air is coming in. Consuming air can cause a negative pressure. Consuming air is the furnace is running and the burners come on and it needs air in order to burn. That's consuming air. That can cause a negative pressure. Furnace fans can cause a negative pressure. The furnace fans are running 
and it's sucking air out of the room, and if there's no air coming in there, it would cause a negative pressure. Fans, bathroom, dryers, range can cause a negative, negative pressure also because it's just taking air out of the house and just throwing it out into the top of the house and which is going outside. Negative pressure creates backdrafting, which backdrafting can spill out carbon monoxide into the house. Combustion gases also has carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide is a safety issue. That's why we use combustion appliances testing to check for potentially dangerous conditions. We'll talk about CAS testing more in another module. Here's that climate map again. We have two ways that we cool our houses. One's an evaporator cooler that we call a swamp cooler. And what it does is put moisture into your house. The second one is air condition. Air condition cools and also dehumidifies your house. All right, this is a split system air conditioner right here. The diagram on the left, this is a furnace that's usually in your basement. On top is the evaporator, and it's shaped as an A, and we call it sometimes the A-coil. And the diagram on the right side, this is your condenser. This is where, you, if you go outside, you put your hand on the top, and the heat will be about 100 degrees, 120 degrees. This is where the heat from the evaporator is dissipated into the air. Now, we have the liquid line, which is a high pressure vapor line, this small one right here, the compressor pumps high pressure vapor, and it brings a high pressure vapor through, and it turns in the liquid and goes through your liquid line, goes up to your evaporator, and becomes a low pressure vapor. Therefore, it also it picks up the heat from inside of the house, and it takes the heat, it drops the temperature down, the heat from inside of the house, then the Freon, puts the heat, pull the heat, and it runs it back in through the suction line right here. And the suction line, it's a low pressure vapor, and it takes it and goes back to the condensing unit, and that's where you feel the heat on top of the unit. Now this cycle continues to go, and it goes, and it goes. But this right here is a very efficient unit if you know how it works, and if you keep it maintained. But split system is, Remember always that it pumps high pressure vapor, low pressure vapor, no liquid. And the evaporator, you will find that in your house and on your furnace. Sometimes it's on the bottom of your furnace. Depends if you got a downflow, this is an upflow type. But these are basically your split systems, what it called. The split system is just another word for one unit outside and one unit inside. Air conditioners are measured by two terms, EER and SEER, energy efficiency ratio, EER. is for window air conditioner units. It represents the cost of operation during a moment in time when the unit is, all, is at a steady state of being used. SEERS, seasonal energy efficiency ratio, is for central air conditioner units. It represents the average cost of the operation of the air condition over the cooling season. Now here we have, this is the evaporative cooler. Some of us call them swamp coolers. Okay, we have two types of direct evaporative cooler. One is a downdraft, the other one is a side draft. The downdraft is you sit up on top of your roofs and it blows the air down into your house by way of a vent. The side draft is you put it on your window, put it on the side of your window, and it blows into the house, and it blow, comes out the sideway, it's exit sideways. These are really good, and especially in a dry climate, because they put moisture into the air. The one thing is, is that people do not take care of their swamp coolers, all right? They say they don't drain them, they don't put antibacteria tablets in there, they don't have a service, and then, when a tech or a company comes out and wants to service it, and they tell you, well, it's going to cost you $250, $230 in, in the average. And, and then you look at them like, well, what? Say, well, when the last time you had a service? They're, oh, five years ago? Well, come on. Okay? You wouldn't take your car and not change the oil or the brakes for five years, and then when you take it into the dealer, and then they say, well, 
hey, it's going to cost you 2000 okay? So we have to service, but you service and maintain it and keep it in good shape, and that's good. The one thing that we also don't do is we put a, we don't put a dehumidifier, well, a humidifier, humidistat on the swamp coolers. If we did, we can control the amount of moisture that goes into a room. The average amount of moisture goes is about 30, 35% humidity. After that, when people keep running it and running it all day, you can get 40, 50% humidity, and instead of feeling cool, you feel soaked, okay? And you don't want to feel soaked. You want to be cool and comfortable. And this one here, this is an indirect swamp cooler. Now, you'll find these over in big colleges that they use them and they put them up on the roofs. You'll never see them like you do the regular direct ones, but they do the cooling and they run through the duct work and bring moisture into the building also. Okay, swamp coolers work where? Here's that building science again. Wet goes to, when it does, it gives up heat equal cool. It is not the water that cools the air, it is the, it's the evaporation, the vapors. Mm-hmm, the vapors. Hot goes to coal, therefore the warm air gives up its heat to the water vapor, right? Ideal range for swamp coolers. On the left side, we have the, the temperature in degrees, this outside temperature. Up here on the top, in the blue, we have our relative humidity, that's outside. So we're in Arizona, temperature's 105 degrees. Now, and we got 2% relative humidity. We come down here, 72 degrees. That's a 33 degree difference right here. That's good for cooling, that's comfortable. Now, on the other hand, that if we are in Louisiana, the temperature is 90 degrees, and the relative humidity is 75%, and we come down here, it's 86 degrees, we're only looking at a four degree difference temperature. And that's not good, you know, 86 degrees, 75% relative humidity, that's not, swamp coolers will not work. In that area, air conditioners will work. Swamp cooler works good in a semi-arid, dry climate. I would not use it in a humid climate because there's no reason to add more humidity to the air. Then the evaporative cooler service. In the fall, we set up, I set up the water, disconnect the water line, drain the water line, drain the pan, install the cover, close inside registers, air seal inside registers. In the spring, we remove the cover, connect the water, turn on the water, test the float, test the pump, install pads every two years, open inside registers. Now, one thing that I would say in that if I, I have air conditioning in my house, but if I had a swamp cooler, I would, <coughs> excuse me, I would change the pads every year, okay? And that's me because I can do it. I can get up on the roof and it doesn't cost me nothing but the cost of the pads, all right? But uh, the more I would maintain my swamp cooler, the cooler I would be, okay? Even if you drop your temperature five degrees down, that's really cool enough. Here is a mini split system. This is about a specific room control, no ducts installed. And this has been out, the mini split system, we call it ductless system, has been out probably within the last 10, 12 years. Um, in the United States here, it's new, but in other countries, Europe, it's not really all that new. Let's say you can't install an air conditioner, so you can't run no duct, so you want to take the condensing unit, this right here, and put it on the outside wall, and then you want to come through and put the evaporator up here, put one here, and put one down at the other end of the room. And that will cool this room, you know. And then you have, this is a remote right here. Uh, the cost of this is, it can be anywhere from $8,000 around in that area to, to install it. It's, just like the air conditioner, but no duct. The line set that it have just pulls it out. You know, pull it, the evaporator right here, after you go through, then the line set is compressed in here, sucks the heat back out here, and it just blows it outside. It's the same thing as the air conditioner. You don't have no ducts to it. 
And um, one thing, the reason that people, a lot of people install them is because they got these big houses. They go buy a 400000 well, $400, home, 5,000 square feet. And on the other end of the house, they got one room that can't, will not get cool because the air conditioning is not working to run way over there because the ducts are not designed, okay? Bad duct work, I call it. Uh, so then you go and you install this. You say, well, hey, I'm on this side of the house and my room is still hot, so I'm gonna put one of these in here and it is still cooling. This is the heat pump and this heat's requiring backup system. Now in the heat pump, what you have in here, you have a reversing valve. It is just a condensing unit with a reversing valve. And instead of putting here in the wintertime, instead of taking the heat and blowing it outside like here in, in the summertime, they take the heat and reverse it and they blow it into the house and come back and it goes through. This is the evaporator. The evaporator gets hot. This is the condenser right here. And the outside air is cool. But the one thing that you do need, you got to have this furnace. You have to have a backup furnace, okay? Because if we get down to about, let's say, five degrees, it ain't going to work, okay? So you got to have a backup. But this is energy efficient. It's the most efficient. This is an air conditioner, a condensing unit. Yeah, it, it works. And in the summertime, you go switch it, and you turn it to the air conditioner. So you're still getting the same effect. Okay, they just have a reversing valve inside of it that switches it from right here instead of the cool air going out, instead of the hot air going out, the hot air goes into the house. Right down here, the hot air, the heated air is going out and then it's going, the cool air is going into the house. So it's just reversing what it does. And, and don't get it confused to thinking that uh, it's something different from your air conditioner. It's just the reversing valve in there which is very efficient. And the heat pump's been around for a long time. One thing, in the hotels, you go into your hotels and you go to the window and you hit the button and you want cooling and the cool comes in and then you want it to be warm and heat comes out, that's your heat pump. Now in this one, the HVAC system size, we're gonna do low calculation, heat loss, gain, duct sizing. The duct size, and that's when you're building a new house. Once your house is built, you can't go in and redo your duct work. You can, it'll cost you some money. A lot of the ducts in the old houses, the houses that are 100 years old, were not made for air conditioning. Okay, they were just made for heat and gravity flow. So now we're coming into today's technology and trying to put a three ton, three and a half ton blower in to go through a duct that was that size for Gravity flow. Duck sizing, when you can get it right, get it right. Okay, if I had a house in mine, I'd tear the walls out and go in and redo all the duck work and get it done right. Is it better to oversize or undersize? An air conditioner or furnace, is it better to oversize or undersize? Better to oversize. And somebody can come up and say, well, it's better to undersize, you know, but you're gonna have, you're gonna, but it's what it is to get it correct, size it correctly. And that's why you got to come in and do your heat load calculations, the heat loss and the gain, okay? Yeah, these are where it goes. You know, you got to size it correctly. Now, with the heat load in here, like for instance, take all these lights up here. Every one of them got a certain amount of heat on them. I think they might be 40 watts, 40, 45 watts, 277 volts, that's light. Take all the bodies that's in here, times 98.6, take the carpet, take the walls, take the paints, take the towel, take all of this. This is what you have to do to find out what size you need to do. The windows, how many panes it got in there, okay? And you come up, I take it to my suppliers once I do all that and get the numbers and then they come back and tell me, well, okay, in here we can put a two ton AC in here, we can put uh, go with a 60,000 BTU instead of an 80,000 BTU furnace. Uh, the best thing to do is to size it correctly and to understand how you get the heat load calculation. I include even these bricks. In the summertime when it's hot, heat's coming off of them bricks. In the wintertime when it's cold, cold's coming off the bricks. Okay, so you have to take all that into consideration. Now, this is the heat load. 
And this right here, this is the winter heat load, but this is the whole envelope of the building right here. And when you do a heat load calculation, you have to take in everything in consideration. It's roof and ceiling laws, the laws through the exposed walls, conduction laws through doors and windows, your ceiling and attic laws, laws petition, duct laws to unconditional space, floor laws to crawl space. So you have to take all this in consideration when you're doing a heat load calculation. And then you got your basement down here, you got your heat for your combustion air, loss through the below grades, all that plays a part in sizing up what kind of, what size air conditioner you need or what size furnace that you need. And this right here is the cooling load. We got half solar, a quarter shell, and a quarter internal loads. And we have the sun here. And we got the, on top of the roof, 100 to 140 degrees. We got gain through exposed walls. We got the attic is 125 degrees. We got external shaded, same as north glass. We got the duct gain. We got the appliances here. We got person in the room. We got the TV. We got the appliance. So all, still again, all of this has to be taken into consideration, which people don't do. A lot of times people want to say, well, uh, what kind of air conditioning you got in there now? Well, I got a three ton. Okay, and they want to go by rule of thumb, thumb. And you say, okay, well, we'll put another three ton in there. You know, this will work. Or they want to go up to a four ton. No, that's incorrect. Do the heat load calculation and get the right tonnage that you need for your house. We're talking about energy audits. You're doing that. If we're going to save energy, be a country to save energy, we got to do things correctly. By the book, not because, oh, I think. The house here has a system. Now we have up here, these are your duct works. Now these are flex type of ducts. The one thing, uh, by code you can use the flex ducts in the attic, but I still like to use the metal ducts because the flex ducts, after a while, they make bends and they cut off the air circulation. Okay. Now right here, number A, we got a leaky duct connection right here. Number B right here, we got a return air leak right here. Number C, we got a couch over the return, okay, blocking the register, and a lot of people do that. And if you see that, pull the couch out from, in, from over the register, okay? We usually say pull it about eight inches away from the wall, eight, nine inches, and you're good. Then we got right here, D, we got the return. If you go down and look at your filter door, you're going to see some gaps in there. And so that's a problem. Then you got E right here, fall in insulation. Now, not too many people crawl up in their crawl space and look and see about the insulation. But uh, as you as building analysis, performing analysis people going out, you might have to take a look and go in there and say, hey, okay, this is what's happening, okay, that your insulation has fell down. F, we got supply leaking right here. And then G, we got the kinks right in here. So all, all of this play a part in people in your house and people houses and the comfort and saving on their utility bills and saving on the, on the electric, saving on the cooling and help your house. You want to come in and you want to be comfortable in your house. It's about being comfortable, you know. And once you find all of these little things that's going on, you can. And I guarantee you, your utility bill will drop. Now, this is, this is your ductwork, and this is a zone system for your ductwork. And this right here, that's the furnace, and that's your main supply coming off. And this is the trunk. It goes down, sometime it'll start like about uh, 21 inches here, and it'll go, and it'll go down to 17 inches, and then it'll get to 15 inches. And they'll branch off and they branch off and they go into different types of different rooms. You may have two registers in one room, one in another, and this is how, this is all your air. This is your registers and all this. So you gotta have a strong enough blower on your furnace to move the air around. That's why it's engineered to do that, okay? And that's why you gotta make sure you get the right type a furnace and the right type of blower. This here is engineered. You can't
can change it a little bit. You can tap in and run some ducks somewhere else. Uh, they make it over that you can do it, but I wouldn't suggest it. All right, this is the ideal duck schematic right here, no leakage. And this is a good the living space, neutral pressure. Return duck at a low pressure right here. Buffer space, neutral pressure. This is the furnace. You supply duck at a high pressure. It is supplying the air into the spaces. No buffer space is typically an attic basement or crawl space. And that's right there. That's a, up under that neutral space. And a lot of times up under here, the best thing, if you insulate this neutral space on the floors, it'd be real good up to the floors. That's it. That right there is perfection, if you believe in perfection. Okay, the duct blaster is for, this is hooked up to the return duct to find out where your leaks are in the return duct, okay? Because just as the supply, we always check the supply, but you gotta check the return duct, and it'll blow the air out and it'll show you. And then you go and seal the ducts up. This is the ducts in your hose. Now right here, you can see a little space in there. All what they used to do is they'll take some sheet metal and run it between the beams and nail it up there and call it to return and just run the return in there. Right now, when you're building new houses, the code is that they're going, they're going into using the metal ductwork for returns instead of just using this. You're going to want the whole metal, and that's where you're losing air. And right in here, this is the same thing. That's the air gap. Once they put the walls in there, you're going to be losing. It's going to be sucking not like it should be. And then right here, we got a hole. This is a return, but we got a hole right in here. And then we got gaps on this side here. So we're trying to bring the return air back and we got all this, we're losing all of this air over the house. Now, this is duct sealant. Now you see right here where you got a crack right there, got an opening, now you're losing a lot. And see, and a lot of times people don't check that. And right here, this is duct tape. You do not use duct tape on ducks, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's called, right here it's called mastic. That's the best way to seal the ducts. Um, and I'll show you what mastic is later on. Now this mastic right here is what seals up the ducts. And once that seal is hardened, so if you want to break the ducts apart, you just can't tear it apart. You got, I mean, just take it apart. You got to tear it apart, okay? But that right there seals up and makes sure you don't have no air leaks. Now this right here, this is a thermostat. And this is one of the better thermostats that I like. This is, it's a Honeywell. It should be an 8,000, they don't say it. But what it does is the accuracy of one degree. So when you got a two-stage furnace, you'll hear your furnace come on and it is shut off. And you think that you're using more energy, but you're not using it. That's the thermostat. They say, we want to hold. If you want to maintain 72 degrees, we're going to let it to maintain 72. If it gets down to 71, we're going to kick it back on, okay? Uh, and this thermostat also, whatever way you decide to use it, you can program it, but then it will adjust to the way that you decide. If you come in and you want to override it, you don't like 72, you want to get it up to 75 and you do it for a matter of days, then it will adjust to the way that you use it. And so, how is a gas fire furnace efficiency represented? BTUs, okay, and what's another one? 80%er, 90%er, AFUE, AFU, I'll say. And the 80, 90%er, 92%er, that's how it's rep the efficiency is represented. What three things are required for combustion? Now, this is the type of water heaters we're gonna have, the gas fire tank, the electric element tank, gas fire tankless on demand. We have a hot water heater. What do the bleep do? We need that. Hot water doesn't need to be heating. George Carlin. <laughs> this is a cutaway of the hot water tank. Now you have the cold water coming in and you got a cold water shutoff valve and the water goes down into here. This is the water line. You got tank insulation. Inside of the tank, you got insulation inside of it. Then you have your dip tube, which is called your anode rod. 
Uh, it takes the metal out of the water and it goes to the rod. You got a drain valve here. What people really don't do is they don't drain their tanks. Okay, so that's why it get corroded and corroded and the water heater goes out at, you're saying about you know, 10 years. It, it is a good idea to drain it. I would say at least twice a year. <coughs> You'd be surprised at the sediments that's in the water, okay? And all of it's going to the bottom of the tank. And uh, so people, people don't do it, but you need to. And then you have the gas burner control, which is a gas valve right here. Okay, so that has a pilot on there. It lights a pilot, and it is set to temperature. And some of them have A, B, C, D. You don't want the water about the water too hot. You don't want the thermostat on there turned up too hot, all the way to hot, because it's scalding. Okay, uh, and you got your overflow pipe, and that comes from the relief valve right there, just in case that you got water coming out. It fills up, doesn't shut off. Then this overflow will come out once it gets hot, and you get the pressure and it comes in a drain on the floor. This is a temperature pressure relief valve. Always, always make sure that works. Check it out, go flip the level. This doesn't have a level on it, flip it, check it out. Even uh, I had to replace a water heater about 10 days ago and I put it in and as soon as I put it in and started up and filled it up, the temperature relief valve started leaking. Brand new, it's not supposed to leak. So I had to take it off and pour and exchange it and for another one. But somebody else would say, oh, well, it'll, it'll cover up. You know, it'll be all right. And no. So you got to pay close attention to this. Then you got the gas supply line, which is usually down here. And you got your gas shut off in here. And then your hot water goes right up here, right to the sink, to all your sinks. This is your electric water heater. It's the same cold water in. You got your pressure relief valve. You got your dip tube. You got your anode rod right here. And you got your drain to the outside. The only thing different is it's just electric and drain to the outside. You got your lower thermostatin element and you got your upper thermostatin element. If one of these elements do go out, then your water is gonna be warm. You're gonna tell the difference of it. And uh, one thing that I say, when you replace one, replace the other. Again. And so then you have the hot water out right here, and you have your electrical supply. Now what you got is 220 volts electrical. Now they're making electric water heaters a lot efficiency also. And so they recover a lot faster and they heat the water up. Okay, now... Just like you saw that video of the water heater exploding, uh, you were talking about disabling the TNP, but also you find them that they will leak too. If they leak, you got to also change them. You could have a problem with them. But people really don't realize how dangerous water heaters are. They don't, you know, from there. And uh, very dangerous. We, you got to, what I say, safety first, right? Safety first. If you don't know about anything, you don't know about your pressure relief valve, and a lot of times you have to check those valves because they will get corroded and they won't open up. Now, on your temperature and pressure relief valve here, uh, they are making them, they make them sometimes on the top and then they make them on the side. Uh, very important, I will stress again that that is a very important piece on there. And also, when you get the temperature relief valve, some of them might have on there, they open up at 30 pounds of pressure per square inch, and they're 100,000 BTU, some of them 200,000, some of them 250,000 BTU. Put the correct one back on the water heater that should be. If you got 100,000 uh, BTU, you want to put 100,000, you don't want to put a 200, 250,000, okay? So you do that, it's very important. And sometimes people just run in and say, give me a temperature pressure relief valve, and they say, well, what you need? And they just give me this one, and they take it and put it on there. You don't want to do that, okay? But they play an important part, very important things. They go on your, they go on water heaters, and they go on your boilers, but very important. Now this is the tankless water heaters right here in which it's the Renai, 
Now, tankless water heaters for the United States is new. For Europe, it's been used for years. Now, the one thing about this is it heats on demand. So you don't have it in a storage tank just uh, sitting there and you can hear your water heater comes on when you're just there, nobody's using it and it come on and off. But the tankless water heater, it will heat on demand, okay? And that's good. Now, it depends. If you got a family of eight, you're gonna need more than just one tankless water heater, okay? But uh, they're very good. I haven't installed one, but I know some people that have them and they, they really like them. This is the way the tankless water heater work. You got your cold water right here coming in and you got your, your heating coils right here. You got your water coming in, it goes through the coils and it heats and it flows and then the hot water goes out. This right here, on and off power switch and this is the power coming in through there. No, no tank at all, instant flow. Now this is, this is your heat pump water heater which is becoming something that is, is new. And I think it just came out within the last year. Okay, but, and it's just like a heat pump. You got your cold water going in, goes down in here to the hot water tank, cold water, ambient temperature, the heat pump water heater, the cool air goes out, hot water returns, and the hot water goes. This is this tank right here. Very new and innovative and uh, I've read up on that and I, I pretty well like it, but I gotta read some more. I haven't seen anybody that installed it in their houses yet. But as you can see, we're going, like we had the heat pumps for your heating and your air conditioning, now we're getting heat pumps for your water heaters. All right, water heater comparison. These are the types of water heaters that we have. We have the electric water heater, which is 95% energy efficient, the best climate, where no gas is available. Yearly energy costs would be about $900 a year. Expected life years is eight to 10 years. Uh, sometimes it's all you got when you just got electrical. Natural gas tank, it is 60% energy efficient. The best climate is any climate. Yearly energy costs about $350. Expected life years, eight to 10 years. Lowest entry price. That's the advantage of it. Propane gas tank, about 65% 65 efficiency. Best climate, any. Yearly energy costs, about $323. Expected life years, eight to 10. Lowest entry price efficiency, that's the advantage of it. And your tankless water heater, that's 80% energy efficient. It's best climate, mild to hot. Yearly energy costs, about $262 a year. Expected life years, 20 years, and advantages, unlimited hot water. The electric heat pump is 2.20% energy efficient. Best climate, any. Yearly energy costs, about $190. Expected life years, 10 years, and lowest electric heating costs. Now, which one do you think you would like to use on that? Which one is it? I'll take the tank. Tankers? Uh, <laughs> the water heater energy factor, measure of the overall and not relative energy efficiency based on how efficiently the energy from the outlet is transferred to the water by the heating element. What percentage of energy is lost during storage of hot water? How much energy is consumed in cycling between active mode and standby? And these are the energy factors. This is the energy guide. And this is a comparison chart also to similar models of this unit. And some models, similar model uses as little as 238 therms per year and as much as 273 therms per year. As you can see, this one used 268 therms per year, which is on more of on the higher side of energy. Now this model also Estimate yearly operating cost is $162 per year. Now rating plates here, we have, it's natural gas, this is the model number, that's the serial number, and that's the manufacturer number. 
It's uh, tank is six years, parts is six years, a limited warranty. It's a 50 gallon, 42,000 BTU rating. Now, this is a fast recovery tank. When you got a, sometimes you got a 40 gallon, 36,000 BTUs, and a 40 gallon, 38,000 BTUs. The 38,000 will recover faster. The 50 gallon, 42,000 BTU will recover a lot faster. So that means you can use your, you washing, you showering, you washing the dishes, and it will recover. It's very unlikely that you will run out of hot water unless you got relatives over for the weekend or something. In review, our inducer fan motor can assist the venting of combustion gases and improve efficiency from a naturally drafted gas water heater. What rating is used to measure a tank's water heater's efficiency? What rating represents low efficiency? 60% efficiency. What rating represents high efficiency? 80% efficiency. What HVAC and water heating equipment are part of a home's base load energy use? Just the water heaters. The water heater is the only one that's running 24-7, 365 days a year. What are common problems associated with gas fired tank water heaters? Flames rollouts, backdrafts. Can you tell us what the anode in a water heater does? Uh, it takes the different metals out of the water and it just, the metals attach to the anodes so it won't be in your tank and just eat the tank up a lot faster. Uh, the anode rod, I haven't replaced, I only replaced about one. People usually don't replace them, but that's what it does. The more you learn when you start getting into the renewable energy, the going green, the BPI, and the more you know, the more money you make. Okay, if you wanna get out into an industry, especially now, how it's just starting and it's just coming about. And, uh, but the one thing is, is knowledge is gonna be the key to making the money, okay? And also safety. Now, I have been in the industry about, I say 20 plus years, I don't like to give up. And I've seen changes and constant changes and changes. And now is a good time, it's a great time for people to get into the industry, okay? Because uh, solar, wind energy, geothermal, it's all coming up, and I think it's a great time for people. I think it's a great time for myself and other people that want to join. And do not ever think that you're behind the curve or you're behind or you should have got in. You're getting in on the right time now, okay? And it's a good time for everybody. You just got to know what you're doing.